morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Our radio ministry today is sponsored by Donna Yuri. The altar flowers are in honor of Eugene and Rita Battenhorst by Gary and Patty. And the bulletins have been sponsored by Laverne and Mary Pomplum. Thank you for your sponsorship and supporting this ministry. One announcement I would like to highlight is that it's time to be thinking about our Easter garden. If you would like to provide a plant for the Easter garden, fill out the pink, right? Slip that's in your bulletins, and you can put those in the offering plate or leave them in the office. If you're listening online or on the radio and would like to participate in the Easter Garden, you can simply call the church office uh, Monday to Thursday mornings between 9 and noon, and they'll take down your information. And we have a mission minute this morning, so Anita... Good morning. Our mission for this month is ELC World Hunger. Um, as members, we are called to respond and assist ELCA in ending hunger and poverty. Um, they kind of go hand in hand. Some of the hunger facts that we see as 820 million people worldwide, or 11% of the world's citizens, cannot access the food they need to live active, healthy lives. 736 million lives throughout the world are in extreme poverty. This I could not even imagine, living on less than a dollar 90 per day. 40 million people in the United States are unsure of where their next meal is going to come from, and 39.7 million people in the United States live below the poverty live poverty level, and for a family of four, that means they're living below $25,000 a year. So ELCA, with our assistance and, and assistance through others throughout the world, do work with over 60 countries to support um, this effort, including uh, areas of the United States. They work to um, provide health clinics, microloans, food pantries, and soup kitchens, and their advocacy to communities to organize our gifts to support meaningful solutions that will help get to the root causes of hunger and poverty and assist them to become more self-reliant and in this area. So again, I think we all realize all the time, and especially with the pandemic that's going on, um, how much need there is out there. And we thank you in advance for your support of this. Thank you, Anita. I invite you all to stand as you're able as we begin worship with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. 
Have mercy on us, Lord, and hear our solemn prayer. Have mercy on us, Christ, and wash away our sin. Have mercy on us, Lord, make sin and shame depart. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. 
and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm is from Psalm 107. Please read responsively. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures us. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe, gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through their sins they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You set forth your word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. This is the word of the Lord. Our, our second reading is from the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us live together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and is seated with us, and is seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his, ki his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as you're able. The Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our gospel reading jumps right into the middle of a much larger conversation. A man by the name of Nicodemus, who is one of the Jewish religious leaders, comes to Jesus in the darkness of the night probably because he doesn't want to be seen. I think he was afraid of what his colleagues might think of him. But for Nicodemus, there's something about Jesus that draws him in. And so he comes to Jesus and, and he says, Jesus, there's obviously something special about you. You're more than just a good teacher. How is it you do this stuff? Tell me, what's the source of your power? And how do I get some of this? Well, what we discover in this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus are two views of salvation that collide. Nicodemus sees it as the work a person does, earning God's favor. And Jesus says, no, no, no. It's all about what God does for us. And Jesus goes on to tell him, you have to be born again. It leaves Nicodemus scratching his head. Reminds me of books I read as a kid, Amelia Bedelia. She was very literal, which led to some very comic stories. So in one book, she um, was told to make a sponge cake. So she mixed up some batter and then she found some sponges and cut them up and put them in the cake mix. It was a sponge cake. Or playing baseball with some kids, she hit the ball and they said, run home, run home. She literally ran all the way to her home. And so when Jesus tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again, he's standing there scratching his head and he goes, how, how can a grown man crawl back into his mother's womb to be born again. He's taking it literally. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm talking about spiritual rebirth, where something regenerates inside of you. It's a changing of your human condition that comes from God. Well, Nicodemus is still trying to figure out what he's talking about. And so Jesus kind of throws out something that Nicodemus can grab hold of. And it's the first two verses of our reading. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Huh? Does that leave you scratching your head going, What's this all about? Well, the lectionary helps us out a bit here. Our first reading is the story that Jesus is referring to. It's this obscure little story in the book of Numbers. The Israelites, having been freed from their bondage in Egypt, are out in the wilderness. They know their destination is the promised land and the route they're taking is not leading them there. And they're impatient. And they're feeling discouraged, maybe even a little bitter, and they start complaining about God and about Moses. And so God lets loose this bunch of fiery snakes amongst them. And the snakes end up biting people. And many of them die from the poison. Now the Israelites think they're being punished. And so they go to Moses and they beg Moses to help them and to go to God on their behalf. And so Moses prays. And God tells Moses, make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole and everybody who looks at that snake will be healed. What? What kind of a story is this? A bronze snake up on a pole? I mean, wouldn't you want something that represents life? Maybe a symbol of hope or a crown or the alpha, the omega, a sign of God or something, but a bronze snake? Well, I was listening to a sermon by Danielle Strickland, and 
She suggests that the point is that in order to be liberated from your suffering is that you need to see the source of it. And so in Numbers 21, the source of suffering is the snakes. It's not God, it's the snakes. It's the snakes who then bite and inflict their venom on the people. That is the source of suffering. And so you need to look up and see the source of your suffering. Which makes sense when we look at the gospel reading because Jesus tells Nicodemus that just like looking up at the snake healed the Israelites, the son of man, he says, is going to be lifted up so that everyone can look at him and live. So in order to be liberated, you need to see the source of your suffering. In Numbers, it was the snakes. You look up and live. To Nicodemus and to all of us, the cause of our suffering in life is not God. It's man. It's us. Now, Nicodemus ends up leaving his conversation with Jesus not really getting it. That is, until Jesus is lifted up on the cross. And it's at that moment that it clicks for Nicodemus. In fact, Nicodemus becomes so radical that he gets the whole story. He is the one to go and ask for Jesus' body so that he can embalm it which he does with an incredible amount of ointment and spices. And why would he do that? Because for Nicodemus, the cross became like a mirror. He saw Jesus, God in the flesh, God a human like us, the Son of Man lifted up on the cross. And what Nicodemus discovered is that that is us. The cause of our suffering and our pain, it's not God, it's us. We are the ones who held the nails. And then the cross becomes liberating because in its truth, we see the source of our suffering is our own brokenness, our human selfishness, our grasping for power, our wanting control, all of this kind of stuff leads us to death, to crucifixion. And when Jesus is lifted up on the cross, not only do we see that the source of our suffering is us, but we also see this incredible demonstration of love. That love can overcome evil with good. You know, it was on the cross that Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And indeed, that is what happens. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And what we see on the cross is not the source of punishment, but what we see is love, God's most amazing love. And the very next verse is probably the most famous verse of all in the Bible, John 3.16, that tells us God loves us. But it starts out with this little three-letter word, for. Okay, for all you word geeks, it's a primary participle that assigns a reason or an explanation. God did all of this. Why? So that God's love for the world would be revealed. This is the way God loves the world, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have the life that never ends. And God didn't go to all this trouble of sending his son to become a human, to live among us, just so he could point a finger at us and condemn us. He did all of this because he loves us and he wants to save us. And so when we look at the cross, 
we see not only that the source of our suffering is us, but we see a power that is greater. We see a power that's greater than our human capacity for evil, a power that is greater than anything. And that power is love. And when you can see that and absorb that, you're liberated from all that causes death. You're set free. You're set free from all of your fears. You're set free by the power of love. About a year ago, there was a story that I heard from Italy. There was a priest in Italy who came down with the coronavirus and due to a bunch of other underlying health conditions, ended up in the hospital on a respirator. And he wasn't doing well. And he saw a young man in a bed near him, struggling to breathe, who didn't have any assistance. And the story is that he took off his own respirator and gave it to that young man, knowing very well it would likely lead to his death. Now, why might someone do that? Why would someone knowingly give up that source of life so someone else could live? I think it's because he wasn't held back by fear, but he was liberated by love. He wasn't afraid of the suffering or even knowing it would lead to his death because he knew the power of love. Anyone who does recovery work knows that the first step into a new way of life is to first acknowledge the limitations of your own power. Left to my own devices, what I end up with is crucifixion. What I end up with is violence. What I end up with is fear, is death. But thanks be to God, there is a power greater than me. And that power is Jesus. That power is love. And that love has the ability to transform you and me from fear to new life. When we know the power of God's love, may it set us free to go and demonstrate that love to the others around us. Amen.
Please stand as you're able. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You sent your son that the world might be saved through him. Inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. Empower missionaries, Bible translators, and ministries of service in your name. Bless our partners in ministry, our ELCA global partner churches, and young adults in global mission. Hear us, O oh God. From east to west, your steadfast love is shown. Nourish seas and deserts, wilderness areas and cities. Give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures. Bless farmers as they prepare for the growing season. Hear us, O oh God. You sustained your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis and scarce resources. Prosper the work of those who aid victims of famine and drought. Especially we pray for the work of ELCA World Hunger. Bring peace in places where scarce resources cause violence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy endures forever. Deliver all who cry to you, especially those who are hungry or without homes. Give life in places where death seems triumphant. Give healing to those who are sick and injured. And bring comfort to those who mourn. Hear us, O oh God. By your grace, we have been saved. Fill this congregation to overflowing with that grace that we show mercy and love to others. Nourish any in our midst who are hungry, especially children, and bless the ministries of feeding and shelter. Give us patience and courage when that way seems long. Hear us, O oh God. Your son was lifted up that whoever believes might have eternal life. We praise you for all who have died in Christ. Bring us with all the saints into the fullness of your promises. Hear us, O oh God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O oh faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of peace with one another. Please be seated. One of the ways in which we express our love and our thanksgiving of praise is through our offerings. 
Thank you to everyone who is giving an offering this morning, those who give online, and those who mail their offerings to the church office. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us prepare now for Holy Communion. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Let us eat together. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us drink together. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news.